So we have a big problem. The problem is how to grow enough food and the right kind of food for a healthy and growing population. And we've seen that the problem is going to get tougher as the population grows and as the environmental threats multiply in the coming years. But the problem is even more complicated, and that is that agriculture itself is one of the major causes of environmental threat. The agricultural sector is the single most important sector from the point of view of human-induced climate change and uh, other environmental damages to the planet. I always find this a little bit counterintuitive. I think the automobile age, that must be the big uh, damage to uh, the environment. Uh, the energy system and fossil fuels, of course, those are huge uh, factors uh, in climate change and in environmental costs. But if we look at a particular sector uh, of the economy, we come back to the original one, to food production itself and to agriculture more generally as the key human activity that puts the most pressures on the planet. What kinds of pressures? Uh, I think uh, it's worth uh, mentioning quickly before delving more deeply into three of them, the range of pressures that the agricultural system and farm practices put on the planet. First is greenhouse gases. We'll turn to this in some detail. But the farm sector is a major emitter of the three main greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And this by itself means that farm practices need to be rethought as we desperately need to move to a low carbon and a low greenhouse gas emission world. The second major impact is uh, through uh, something very uh, rarely uh, discussed in, uh, in, uh, in the, the public but of increasing concern among specialists, and that is on the nitrogen cycle. There's a natural nitrogen cycle. Uh, our atmosphere uh, is 79% uh, nitrogen in the form of N2. That kind of nitrogen is uh, inert, uh, odorless, uh, 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 without uh, taste, uh, and not very useful actually for us. But nitrogen in its reactive uh, forms uh, of uh, nitrates and nitrites uh, and ammonia and ammonium uh, ion and uh, its other reactive forms is absolutely vital for us uh, and for all the rest of uh, living uh, species uh, because nitrogen is the backbone of amino acids and, and the proteins. It's uh, absolutely core to uh, our metabolism uh, and to uh, every aspect of our lives, including the ability to grow food. It's for that reason we put a lot of nitrogen on the soil in the form of nitrogen-based fertilizers to help feed the nutrients to our crops so that our crops feed us. But the damage of that human intervention into a natural nitrogen cycle is enormous. We'll look at that in just a moment. A third major way that the farm system impacts on the planet is the destruction of habitat for other species. Not entirely surprising when we consider that 40% of the total land area of the planet is agricultural land, whether the arable land or the meadows and pasture lands. Humanity's already grabbed so much of the land area for us but it's grabbing more, especially in the form of deforestation. And the rainforests that are at risk right now are places of incredible and irreplaceable biodiversity. And so one of the major ways that the Earth is uh, vulnerable to the sixth great extinction wave that we have already discussed is through the tropical rainforest deforestation, which is part of the ongoing process of 
clearing lands for arable and for pasture land. There are many other ways which I've mentioned where the environment is at threat from uh, farming activity. The pesticides, the herbicides, the other chemicals that are used in farm production are a major threat to biodiversity. And especially the massive amounts of water that are used, around 70% of the total human uh, use of fresh water goes through agriculture with only 10% going through household use and the remaining 20% or so uh, for industrial processes. Agriculture is a voracious user of water, and that water itself is under threat. So for all of these reasons, the agriculture sector is a key driver of anthropogenic environmental loss. And we're going to need to change technologies and processes <coughs> and patterns of land use to make the food system compatible with a sustainable planet. Let's have a look at the first of those th three drivers that I discussed, uh, climate change, nitrogen cycle, and land use, where I want to look more deeply uh, at the role of agriculture. This uh, pie chart shows us the uh, estimated total amount of greenhouse gases uh, that are emitted, allocated across various sectors of the economy. The power sector, for example, through the burning of coal, oil, and gas, is responsible for a massive amount of CO2 emissions and for an estimated 24%, roughly a quarter, of the total greenhouse gas emissions. The transport sector, the internal combustion engine in the cars and in the trucks, is responsible for an estimated 14% of total emissions. Industrial processes, for example, steel production or petrochemical production, another one-seventh or 14 percent of total greenhouse gas emissions. The non-energy sphere is responsible for around one-third of the total greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that is CO2 emissions, methane, nitrous oxide, and chemical pollutants uh, from specific chemicals like uh, hydrofluorocarbons that are not the emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels. Within that category, agriculture plays a huge role. Of course, uh, agriculture emits greenhouse gases uh, in the transport sector, uh, in uh, uh, tractors uh, and in uh, transport of food. Uh, it emits uh, greenhouse gases uh, in uh, the industrial sector for the production of chemical fertilizers. But there's a massive amount of greenhouse gas emissions that is not directly from fossil fuels at all. This includes, for example, the emissions that come from clearing forests. As the trees are chopped down, as they're burned, as they decay, CO2 that was sequestered in the forests are emitted into the atmosphere. And several billion tons every year of CO2 come from deforestation. Agriculture also is a major source, as I've mentioned earlier, of the second and third ranking greenhouse gases. Methane, CH4, is emitted in certain uh, crop production, such as uh, paddy rice, and it's also emitted uh, through uh, livestock, through the ruminants, uh, who, uh, uh, through the, the uh, natural processes of their digestion, uh, give rise to uh, quite a lot of methane emissions, both from the front and the back of the animals, uh, I should mention. Uh, and uh, this uh, also contributes to uh, the increase in concentration of methane in the atmosphere, a very powerful greenhouse gas. Nitrous oxide, N2O, is also emitted from agriculture. <clears throat> it is one of the ways that nitrogen-based fertilizers uh, uh, degrade uh, instead of being taken up by the plants. 
Uh, they volatilize, go into uh, the atmosphere, they go into the, the water supply, and one of the parts of the nitrogen cycle is from uh, the livestock and from the fertilizer use uh, into uh, increased uh, emissions of nitrous oxide. And this also adds to the total uh, amount of greenhouse gases that uh, agriculture uh, uh, contributes uh, to the overall process. When you look at it, more than one-third of total emissions are due to land use change such as deforestation and the direct emissions of greenhouse gases from agricultural production. It's astounding. Roughly one-third of total greenhouse gases directly come from the agriculture sector and there are bits and pieces more through the fertilizer manufacturing and through the direct expenditure of fossil fuel-based energy as inputs to agriculture on top of that one-third. So we see that indeed the agriculture sector is a major contributor to greenhouse uh, gases and to climate change as well as the first sector to lose from this. This is uh, a uh, terrible two-way problem that needs to be addressed through improved agricultural processes, as I'll be discussing shortly. Let me turn to the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle, vital for life, has been overtaken by humanity. Absolutely extraordinary. In nature, the N2 uh, molecules in the atmosphere uh, are converted into reactive nitrogen through various biological processes of nitrogen fixing bacteria as well as through physical processes of lightning for example uh, that breaks the very strong triple bond of the N2 molecule uh, and by disassociating the N2 molecule leads to the formation of of ammonia and uh, other reactive nitrogen. In that normal process, the cycle from N2 to reactive nitrogen compounds like nitrates, nitrites, uh, and ammonia, and then back through respiration uh, and through, uh, uh, through biological processes to back to N2 is a natural nitrogen cycle. But humanity is now creating even more reactive nitrogen than nature itself. We're doing it in our industrial plants at a mega scale, 100 million tons uh, or more per year of nitrogen-based fertilizers. Back in the early years of the 20th century, two great chemical engineers, Haber and Bosch, developed a process that uh, some consider to be the single most important innovation of the 20th century, one that almost none of us has heard of, in fact, but changed the world. The Haber-Bosch process, so-called, is a way through application of high amounts of energy and the use of various uh, um, identified catalysts to break that N2 bond to create in a chemical fact process, uh, in, in a factory basis, ammonia. And that ammonia can then be used to provide uh, the base uh, stock for urea and other nitrogen-based fertilizers. Up until the Haber-Bosch process, the nitrogen that was deposited uh, on the soils either came from the manures of farm animals or it came from the mining of uh, excrement off the coast of Peru and Chile uh, of uh, bats and birds, the so-called guano, which was being mined as a uh, nitrogen source for fertilizer for Europe. But it was being quickly depleted, and there was a crisis at the end of the 19th century. What are we going to do with the encroaching nitrogen scarcity? Along came Haber and Bosch, the Haber-Bosch process, nitrogen-based fertilizer, and what was then a world population of under 2 billion became during the 20th century a population of more than three times that and now reaching 
7.2 billion people. And it was the advent of nitrogen-based fertilizer, among other things, and including, of course, the high-yield seed varieties and other agronomic advances that made it possible to produce enough food to support 7.2 billion people, even if, I must add, uh, a large number of them, 3 billion, are not well-nourished uh, on that food supply. But with all that nitrogen now being converted from N2 into reactive nitrogen, we have a mega problem. And the mega problem is shown in this complicated flow chart of what happens to that nitrogen when it is used in the farms. And then it runs off. In some ways, it enters the water supply as nitrates, uh, causing a danger to the water supply. Uh, some of it runs into the rivers and the sea, and we've already seen how that leads to algal blooms and eutrophication. Some of it enters uh, the atmosphere not as N2O, but as NO2, which causes smog in our cities. And so from the fertilizer deposit come a host of problems there's addition to greenhouse gases. There is acidification of soils by the nitrogen that is put into the soils. There is the worsening water quality that comes from the nitrates and the nitrites running into the water supply. There is the damage to ecosystems of eutrophication of the estuaries. There is the fall of air quality as the NOxes, uh, the NO2, NO3s, and uh, uh, other, uh, other uh, effects of the uh, nitrogen uh, enter uh, the urban atmosphere to create smog, to create uh, tropospheric uh, ozone, uh, and to create massive health hazards in our cities. So here is a, a dilemma that is a mega dilemma and hardly discussed uh, in our day-to-day uh, -day life. We need the nitrogen for our food production, and yet the consequences of the nitrogen on the physical environment in multiple ways, from climate change to eutrophication to urban smog to poisoning of our water supplies, is growing. This map comes from a study showing Estuaries around the world suffering from eutrophication, from nitrogen and phosphorus-based fertilizers. A huge problem, these are the dead zones in our coastal areas, killing vital uh, parts of uh, the marine ecology. And the problem is growing, and it is likely to get worse unless we address how to use nitrogen in a more responsible way third area that I wanted to mention in depth is the forests. And just to point out that the forest uh, uh, loss that is occurring in all of the great rainforest regions in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, and in the Indonesian archipelago have multiple drivers that differ across regions. In the Amazon, most of the loss of the rainforest has come through the clearing of the rainforest to make way for new pasture land and new farmland, or because of the building of infrastructure such as roads in the Amazon. In Southeast Asia, where there's also a large loss, the drivers are somewhat different. The drivers there are logging for tropical hardwoods, in huge demand for China's booming economy, and also for clearing the rainforest to grow uh, tree crop plantations, of which the fastest growing, taking over uh, large areas in Indonesia and Malaysia, is palm oil. In Africa, there is yet another driver, uh, and that is peasant smallholder agriculture not clearing uh, especially for uh, tropical logging or for tree plantations or even for large pasture land, but just the spread of smallholder farmers into the forest margin and often a huge use of the forest and an unsustainable use for fuel wood 
and for charcoal. In the wealthier uh, regions of the Amazon uh, in Brazil and in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the fuel wood problem is not as severe because there are alternative energy sources. But in the Congo Basin, for example, and in other uh, forest areas of Africa where populations are very, very poor and where alternative fuel sources uh, such as uh, um, natural gas or, uh, or elect electricity uh, are not available, uh, charcoal is used in such large amounts that that is a key driver of the deforestation uh, and a key driver of the loss of habitat. Clearly, in each of these areas, in order to preserve habitat, protect biodiversity, reduce the greenhouse gas emission consequences of deforestation, actions are going to need to be introduced that are responsive to the particular challenges in those areas uh, and the particular needs of the local populations. This will play an enormously important role in helping to reduce the uh, rate of uh, climate change, but also will be absolutely vital if we are to succeed in heading off the massive loss of biodiversity.